You know, we're really at a critical turning point right now, I think, in the legal field, uh, in the legal industry and, and in, in society at large. And so far as, uh, you know, this isn't just about lawyers, but it's about the people who need us as well. We're still a long way from that. We still have a huge gap in access to justice. So, I, I mean, I really would like to see that technology ends up being a product that is driving a, a greater good in the legal profession. And that's our being able to, to bridge that justice gap and, and serve everybody who needs to be served. I'm Andrew Booth, and this is Matters. Matters is a podcast presented by Clio, the world's leading cloud-based legal technology provider, where we look at small changes that can make a big impact on your daily life and practice. In this episode, we'll be talking about technological competence and why it matters. Technology is changing countless industries, shifting paradigms, and restructuring the way organizations operate. In legal, technology has begun to usher in a new era where lawyers and law firms find innovative ways to deliver services to clients. Now and in the years to come, Legal professionals and practices that are able to adapt with these changes will be the ones that succeed in the long run. When I first started kind of writing about this stuff, I was thinking, well, you know, I'll, I'll write about this stuff for a couple of years and by then everybody will have it figured out and there won't be any need for me to be writing about it anymore. That's Bob Ambrosi, who is without a doubt one of the most respected and well-known journalists who covers the legal technology space. Uh, and here we are all these years later, and a lot of lawyers still haven't figured it out at all. Besides being the founder of the Law Sites blog, Bob is a lawyer and consultant who has written multiple books, hosts a podcast called Law Next, and written and spoken about the intersection of law and technology for over 20 years. During that time, Bob has seen the legal industry come a long way in terms of tech competence, but he also feels there's an even longer road ahead. There are still an awful lot of lawyers who, who still don't get technology or who still don't use it well. And I, I tend to feel that a lot of a lot of those lawyers, I don't like to say this because I, I feel like a lot of those lawyers tend to be in solo, in solo and small firm practices. And on, on one hand, I know a lot of solos and small firm lawyers who are miles ahead of the rest of the the rest of the group in terms of their adoption and use of technology. Uh, but I, I do a lot of speaking. I, I go around a lot to bar associations and I often at solo and small firm conferences. And I still meet an awful lot of lawyers there who just kind of throw up their hands when you start to talk about technology or or tell you things like, you know, they're they're going to go to their graves without learning about technology or, or they're long since going to be retired before they, they ever have to learn about technology. They, they still see it as something in the future rather than something in the present. And, you know, that's troubling because those lawyers are, are representing clients today and uh, need to have those skills and don't. Despite the slow pace of technological adoption across the legal industry at large, Bob clarifies that a good deal of lawyers have embraced legal technology in a meaningful way. And over the past five to ten years, he has seen a profound shift in the way legal professionals use technology in their firm. To him, this is encouraging and necessary. As the practice of law evolves to keep pace with society, Bob believes that tech competence is a standard of ethical and professional importance. Well, there's a couple of reasons. I mean, one right now is the simple fact that this is becoming uh, understood to be an ethical requirement that uh, you know i i've written a lot about the what i what i like to call the duty of technology competence but uh, you know the aba uh, amended the the model rules back in 2012 to uh, create a requirement that lawyers have a, a duty to keep abreast with changes in technology and the benefits and risks of technology that has now been adopted here in the U.S. by 36 states, formally adopted by 36 states and a couple of others that are considering it or have kind of informally adopted it through ethics opinion. So, you know, as, as a matter of professional responsibility, lawyers have a duty to be technologically competent. 
Uh, but more importantly than that, I, I think I think what really matters is that I don't think a lawyer today cannot competently represent a client without at least a minimum level of competence in technology. And there's there's kind of two sides to that. I mean, one on one side, technology provides the tools that help a lawyer do a better job, compete effectively, represent the client effectively, deliver results at lower cost. So the tools of the trade, so to speak, are, are, are technology tools these days. And then, you know, the other side to that is your clients are using technology and, and you can't effectively or competently represent them in their matters if you don't understand the technology they're using or how technology could impact their case. Similar to Bob, attorney Monica Goyle, CEO and partner of Monica N. Goyle LPC, feels that the legal community as a whole has been slower to adopt new technologies than it should be. Before starting her own firm, which specializes in business and technology law, Monica worked as an engineer for tech companies in Silicon Valley, and then she founded her own legal tech startup called My Legal Briefcase. That experience taught her a lot about lawyers' tech competence and why it was hard to move the industry forward. As a result, Monica began working with law students as an adjunct professor at the Osgood Hall Law School at York University in Toronto. There, she has taught tomorrow's lawyers about legal information technology and legal app development. She feels these are essential subjects not just for law students, but for all legal professionals. When I think of tech competence, I think about you know, how are lawyers actually doing their work? Are they doing work in the most productive and efficient way that they could for their clients? We have a rules of professional conduct that govern how we're supposed to deliver services. And in those rules, it says that you are supposed to deliver services in a timely and cost-effective manner. So you're supposed to be, uh, as a lawyer, doing those things. And so there is an ethical component to that because if you're not, if you're doing your work in a way that is not the most productive or efficient way, and that is re resulting in more kind of legal costs for your client, that is an ethical issue. And I believe that that's an access to justice issue because it's expensive for most uh, Canadians and Americans to afford a lawyer. I see technology as being kind of a key way that we could um, deliver legal services in a way that's more efficient, cost efficient for uh, just the average person out there. And so I think tech competency is a key component of that. One of the things that Monica notices that holds legal professionals back is a lack of training during both law school and at their firms. Lawyers and other legal staff, she says, aren't being given the tools and knowledge they need to understand which tech options are available to them, or how to use different software platforms and applications to do their jobs more effectively. She believes law schools, firms, and bar associations should incentivize legal tech training so lawyers prioritize these skill sets, because right now, lawyers are just teaching themselves how to use tech tools, and that often isn't enough. I, I think a real problem for a lot of lawyers is not that they don't want to learn about technology or don't want to become more proficient in technology. It's that they don't have time in their day. Clio's own uh, legal trend survey, uh, you know, it does a great job of sort of documenting the, the difficulty lawyers already have in finding time during the day to practice law. Uh, and learning about technology is something that they see as as a time suck, uh, and they just don't have the, the time to to uh, to do that to to kind of sit down and try and figure out. I mean, one of the most one of the most common questions I get from lawyers, and, I, and I'm not saying this just because this is a Clio podcast, but is is often you know I know I should get a practice management solution, but I don't know which one. Can you just tell me? I have to answer that. No, I can't just tell you. There's a lot of variables in that and, and uh, you need to do some research and need to do some work or, or get a consultant or something. But, uh, you know, they, they just lawyers just want somebody to figure it out for them. Uh, they don't have the time to do it. And uh, that that's a real difficult problem to overcome. 
Bob says that the simple fact of bars adopting the duty of technology competence standards is a major step towards overcoming legal's technology gap, because it signifies to lawyers that this is important. It's something they have to learn, something that is considered one of the necessary skill sets for being a lawyer. He says two states have already adopted a continuing legal education requirement for technology training, and he thinks that the more states that follow suit, the clearer the need for tech competence will become. In both his and Monica's eyes, there is already a difference between firms that embrace technology versus those that don't, and in the years ahead, they believe this divide is only going to widen. Bob references a 2019 study put together by the legal publishing company Walters Kluwer, which delves into the concept of the future-ready lawyer. Basically, they looked at firms uh, that had been kind of early adopters of technology in their firms and, and how they compared to firms that had been slower uh, or, or are still dragging their feet in adopting technology. Uh, and, and that survey found very clear and demonstrable advantages to law firms that had adopted technology, uh, including that uh, generally acro- across the board, firms that, that already were making good use of technology tended to be more profitable than other firms. You know, that, that's an interesting point because sometimes one of the arguments that you hear lawyers make against technology is that they worry that technology is going to cut into their profits because they worry that, you know, they, they bill by the hour. And if they get a, a tool that's going to help them be more efficient and make it take less time to get work done, that uh, therefore they're not going to be billing as much. Uh, and, and the evidence points exactly to the contrary. The Future Ready Lawyer Survey breaks law firms into three categories based on overall tech adoption, leading, transitioning, and trailing. Leading firms are already using technology well and will continue to implement new tech in the next three years. Transitioning firms are using technology to a degree now and plan to use more in the future. And trailing firms don't use technology much now and don't plan to use much in the years ahead. According to the survey, only 34% of lawyers overall believe their firm is very prepared to keep pace with changes in the legal market. But at technology leading organizations, this rate climbs to 50%. Still, this and other stats in the survey show just how large the gap is between the need for firms to adopt technology and their readiness to do so. The survey reports that 72% of respondents say that dealing with large amounts of complex information is a top trend. Yet only 31% feel very prepared to address it. Bob mentions that firms which are seen as technology leaders are more nimble, more able to respond to industry shifts, and more profitable. He believes these leading firms fare so well because technology enables them to be more competitive in the marketplace, to land more clients, to do more work in less time, and to offer billing models that clients prefer. As Bob himself is quoted in the survey, the best way to be future ready is to not wait until the future to prepare. And firms that wait too long to change their ways face significant risks. Yeah, ethics, ethics, and, and even malpractice uh, lawsuits are huge risk factors in the technology area. And I, and I think a lot of lawyers underestimate or or don't even think about that risk. The American Bar Association put out an, an ethics opinion that talked about a lawyer's obligations with regard to protecting confidential communications. And that ethics opinion made very clear that lawyers have Uh, a responsibility in every single case they handle to evaluate the technology that will be used to communicate with the client, whether it's email or file transfers or where files will be stored, digital files will be stored, whether it's in the cloud or in in a local uh, installation somewhere, you know, and, and to understand what the risks are, uh, understand what the, who the vendors are, who are going to be storing that data. Uh, there are there are complex questions that lawyers need to be exploring. My experience suggests that that there are an awful lot of lawyers out there who don't wouldn't even know where to begin in asking the right questions around this sort of thing. They don't understand the technologies at play here. We have not so far seen any kind of major cases where a lawyer has been 
I don't know, like disbarred or something over technological incompetence. There have been some cases where lawyers have been subjected to uh, bar discipline for incompetence. So I, I think we are going to see more of those kinds of matters coming to the surface and perhaps one big one somewhere that's really going to be a wake up call to lawyers that, uh, boy, I can I can really get in trouble here if I don't understand this stuff. The other major risk Bob identifies for firms is the very real possibility of getting left behind while competitors modernize in advance. He says that at many firms which are currently making lots of money, there tends to be resistance to implementing new technologies because things are working well at present. But in the long run, this will make the firms vulnerable. Well, what we see there is that there is increasingly competition from tech-savvy operations of one kind or another. I mean, the, the, the biggest sources of competition for larger established firms right now are two. There are two sources. One is other firms that are more nimble and savvy about technology. We, we've seen, especially in the last couple of years, uh, a number of law firms that have launched technology initiatives either within the firm uh, or even as separate spin-offs to develop technology to use with their clients. So those firms are, are clearly going to have a, a competitive advantage. Bob says the other major sources of competition are alternative legal service providers, or ALSPs. These organizations provide legal services to clients but have different business models than the typical law firms. Notably, the big four companies of Deloitte, Ernst & Young, PwC and KPMG are among the types of business operations which are venturing successfully into legal. They are using uh, the old uh, people process technology formula to do it very successfully, and they are delivering services uh, more efficiently and at lower cost and, and picking up uh, greater and greater shares of the market. Bob adds that the biggest pressure on law firms to adopt legal technology comes from their clients, who are much savvier and pickier today than they used to be. And Monica couldn't agree more. She says that firms have no choice but to become technologically competent. You know, the market has already moved, there's already momentum, and their clients are already kind of using certain technologies. And so to be with your to be working with your clients, you're going to have to get on board and use the technologies. And we've seen this in law in other cases where, you know, maybe email, for example, lawyers were kind of late adopters of email, but their clients kind of forced them to use and adopt um, email. So I would say one thing is that they have to kind of get up to date in learning these technologies, new technologies to kind of be working with their clients. In order to change lawyers' and firms' mindsets regarding tech adoption, Monica says there are a number of things that need to happen. I think that even from an early stage, like at the law schools, at the law school level, law students should be exposed to and starting to get skills and training around the different technologies so that they already have some of that expertise going into their job so they don't have that additional pressure when they're practicing law. And then I think for lawyers, I think it it's really depends on, are you in a big firm or are you in a, a solo or a small firm? Like it's, those are gonna be factors that are gonna influence how much time the lawyer has, um, but they should be prioritizing at least some of this because there's real benefits that they can get by improving their technological capabilities. One of these real benefits Monica speaks about is the competitive advantage of advertising and marketing a firm's services better. Thanks to technology, she says firms which are more ahead of the game can better target their ideal audiences in order to get more and better clients. And then the second thing that I think is a real benefit is that um, if you're like, for example, a solo small firm lawyer, I tell like all of my friends to use Clio. Clio is just an example of a really great cloud practice management platform, but it really has helped me to kind of streamline the backend processes. 
And so by streamlining, uh, automating or streamlining some of those administrative type of tasks, you can really help to reduce your overhead. Bob echoes Monica's feelings that the value of legal technology for solo and small firms is huge. The greatest benefit of technology for solo and small firm lawyers has always been that it it levels the playing field for them. Uh, you know, the, the time was, uh, going back to when I started out in law practice, that solos were solo and small firms were at a real disadvantage in, in certain kinds of matters, in particular to litigating large matters, for example. And now there are tools that you know bring that all down to scale, that that make it so that in fact a, a solo lawyer or a small firm lawyer can uh, just as effectively. Uh, represent a client in a, in a significant litigation. Uh, you know, hearkening back to that 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 Clio survey. I mean, one of, again, one of the problems that lawyers have is just finding enough hours in the day, and technology uh, gives you back some of that time if you're using it. So there are real lifestyle advantages as well to being technologically competent. Whether you're just starting out with legal technology, or even if you're already well versed in this area. Our experts say there are a number of ways to improve. Going to conferences uh, turns out to be a really good way to learn about using technology in your practice. Uh, the CleoCon conference is, is a great conference for that. I've written uh, favorably on my blog about the Clio conference is a great place to go and learn about technology. The ABA Tech Show, any of the number of, uh, uh, you know, most of the state bars put on some degree, some sort of a technology conference or a solo small conference that has a lot of technology uh, components to it. The best way you can learn is hands-on. The best way you can learn is to start to use some of these things. And I, and I realize that's that's a daunting proposition in, in and of itself, because if you don't understand the technology, you don't know how to get your hands onto it and start using it. But the more uh, you can start using it, reading about it, there are a number of good legal tech blogs out there. Uh, you know, uh, good magazines. The uh, ABA uh, Law Practice Today is a great, uh, great magazine for following developments in technology. So, you know, really read, go to conferences, uh, educate yourself, uh, take some time to do it. In the long run, it's going to be time well spent. For Monica, hands-on learning is critical, especially when law students and lawyers start to really understand how implementing tech can change the practice of law. I do see that the students that I'm teaching, I see it when they get that aha moment, that this is the future, this is what's happening. And I think that they are still going to go into these work environments where they'll see that things are very different, that they're still you know, not using the technologies that they've been exposed to. But I think that they are still these change agents in these places. So I see that as one thing that could potentially help to change things in the profession. Monica also feels that firms which incentivize tech competence are moving the needle for the industry. She says some forward-thinking firms are giving lawyers billable time for learning tech skills, offering training resources to their staff, and asking for innovative ideas so legal professionals start to think of new ways to use technology. With some of her students, she has them choose legal problems they want to solve and create new apps to fix those issues. Monica gets passionate when she talks about her students and the need for better adoption of tech in the legal industry. And one thing she stresses is that lawyers don't need to learn to code or understand artificial intelligence. They just need to understand the essential tools that can help them drive their practices forward. If you're reluctant to even just use these tools in an efficient, productive manner, if you put a more sophisticated tool, but you're not doing the training and learning around that tool, how do you know that you're going to get the most out of it? When it comes to identifying the best tech solutions for lawyers, especially those who aren't the most tech savvy to begin with, Bob and Monica have a few suggestions, and not surprisingly, around practice management, client intake, and client relationship management. I've said this any number of times that I think the practice management software is number one. Uh, I think the uh, growth in practice management over the past 10 years has 
been one of the most important trends of the last decade in the legal profession. Companies such as Clio, uh, you know, Rocket Matter, my case, I mean, any number of companies out there that have really pioneered this area uh, have made this software easier to use uh, and uh, uh, more easily available to lawyers. And as a result, more lawyers are using it. Uh, and uh, I, I, you know, I think that's I think that's the number one key to protecting yourself as a lawyer to, to better serving your client uh, and and to uh, maintaining your sanity, I guess, as a lawyer is to have a good practice management platform. I have my documents like on the cloud. I can easily share with my clients uh, their documents. I use, for example, um, Clio as a kind of a CRM, so uh, client relationship management tool, but also to keep track of every single step that we take on a file. And I can then share that information with my clients so they can see these are all the steps that we've taken. And so if they have to ever create a summary of what we've done on a case or what we've done on a particular matter, they can see all of that information in the system. And so that's like almost a, you know, next level, I think, in terms of how you kind of engage and uh, interact with the client. Looking ahead to the future, Bob feels that legal technology companies like Clio will continue to steer the industry towards embracing newer and more powerful tools. In in my mind, it's not an understatement to say, you know, it's it's really kind of caused a revolution in the way that lawyers run their practices. And uh, I I really think that that's been the most dramatic change over the last 10 years that I've witnessed uh, as somebody who follows this space has been just the the much wider adoption of practice management software and, and the much wider understanding of of why you should adopt it in the first place and why it matters to have it. In terms of moving this into the next, you know, where, where do we go from here and what's Clio's role in that? Clio has the potential to continue to define and revolutionize this space. I mean, what I really continue to hope for is that legal technology will enable the legal profession to better serve those who need its services. And uh, we're still a long way from that. We still have a huge gap in access to justice uh, by people who are low or moderate income or small businesses. Uh, Those people have trouble getting the legal help they need, often don't even know when they need legal help. So I, I mean, I really would like to see that technology ends up being a product that is driving a, a greater good in the legal profession, and that's our being able to, to bridge that justice gap and, and serve everybody who needs to be served. Thanks for listening to the 10th episode of Matters. To learn more about tech competence and the way you can improve your legal tech skills, or to read the Future Ready Lawyer Report, check out the resources section of this podcast. Matters is produced by Andrew Booth, Sam Rosenthal, Teresa Matich, and Derek Bolin, and by Clio, the world's leading cloud-based legal technology provider. Be sure to subscribe to Matters so you never miss an episode. If you'd like to learn more about Clio, please visit us at clio.com.